What's going on, everyone? Welcome back into some more Anno 1800 with a continuation of our uh, ultimate guide. I have rebranded it. I keep trying to say the beginner's guide, but it is the continuation of our ultimate guide to Anno 1800. Today's episode is going to be all about getting into the artisan phase of the game, things you need to know to get through the artisan tier, and some more advanced concepts when it comes to income and maintenance and things like that, as well as taking a look at uh, some other things you could do with your workforce and something called working conditions. <clears throat> so with that, let's jump right in and get ourselves going with some artisans. So just like with the uh, farmers beforehand, to upgrade to artisans, we got to make sure we have all the needs met under the needs tab. And we have uh, 20 out of 20 in our homes. And then the lovely little upgrade button comes up and we can get ourselves into the artisan phase of the game. So here we go with our first artisans in the city, and it unlocks the need to be able to produce windows, canned foods, and we can build town halls. Now, town halls and trade unions will get their own little short uh, episode just to talk about those specifically later on and things you can do with them. Now, the first thing that pops up when you ever you get your artisans in is the New World Expedition. I do advise you go ahead and get this going as quickly as possible so you can get the New World unlocked. So we're going to go ahead and assign our flagship. He already has some stuff on him. I've picked up a few extra things as well uh, from quests. I am going to put that ensign on in place of the square rigging. No, I'm going to try to. There we go. Put that ensign on. Now in, terms of our, now, in terms of the goods that we're going to send on it, what you normally want to do is check up here to see what it thinks that you might need. So it's saying that we might want to cover force faith and diplomacy and as well as always take some rations with us uh what i recommend doing for this particular expedition is take maybe about 30 about 30 schnapps take about 10 soap and then take along um you know what let's not do fish let's do bread take along about 30 bread. That's about all you need. You don't need 50 of everything. Just take along, you know, some schnapps, soap, and bread. Uh, soap is really, really good because it has a guaranteed chance of success for quite a few of the illness events that happen on expeditions. Uh, bread acts for faith and as a ration, and schnapps also acts as a medicine type as well as soap, and it has a few uh, different applications where you will always get a bonus from it. Um, so we're going to take all of that. We're going, and we're at hundred percent morale. We're going to start that expedition to the new world. Now you see right here, we've got a festival going on the arts festival. This, uh, there are lots of different festivals in the game. I'm going to have a pinned comment down below with the link to the attractiveness page over on the, uh, Anno 1800 wiki, and it will show it's either attractiveness or happiness. One of those two, it'll be linked down below. I can't remember all of a sudden now, but it will have a list of all the different festival types. This particular festival gives us 400 attractiveness across the island and a minus 50% maintenance cost for all public services and cultural buildings have a maintenance cost minus 100% and get a little more attractiveness from everything. This is a, this is an okay festival. It's, you know, it's not amazing, but it's all right. There are some festivals that throw people off, especially the harvest festival, because you get champagne, rum, and cigars from that festival. And people are all, will be looking in their warehouse trying to figure out where the champagne, rum, and cigars come from. Well, those come from a harvest festival. There's also a festival called Commemoration Day, which throws people off because it increases weapon chain production by 300%. But that weapon chain production by 300% includes everything in the chain, including furnaces, iron mines, charcoal kilns, and charcoal mines. It throws people off because they think they're making a lot more of these goods than they really are. And they all of a sudden start building more weapon factories or more sewing machines or more steelworks or what have you. And then the festival ends and they are out of goods because they weren't actually producing that much. It was because of a festival. So just keep an eye at all times up here. And you can always tell us if there's a festival going because you'll see parades going and hear some music. So always check your, to see if there's a festival going on and what the effects of it are. One other quick thing to note before we get started is you'll see that I upgraded to brick roads in a lot of our town right here. Brick roads found under the, or paved streets rather, I'm sorry, found underneath the workers tab. 
extend the range of public services, as well as increase the uh, speed at which carts and later on uh, transportation vehicles can move around your city. So it extends the range of things like the pub. The pub will have a larger range because of the brick roads around it or paved streets. I'm going to call them brick roads just because that's what I keep calling them. Um, it will have a larger range that it can reach. The market can reach more stuff. The school can reach more. Anything that is a public service or emergency service will have a larger radius that it can reach because of paved roads. If you have DLCs like the Seat of Power, it also increases the range of the palace itself. There's lots of different things that, that uh, paved streets and brick, ro or, and or brick roads, whatever you want to call them, uh, can extend. So just try to upgrade to brick roads as often as you can. It does take a lot of bricks and they do cost a little bit of money. So, but just keep those going because they are really, really handy. All right, so I've skipped ahead a little bit and we have expanded out our city of artisans right here. We have a nice little clump of them. Uh, we have a total of 400 artisans now on the island. I've also expanded out our uh, uh, beer production right here. I cannot talk this evening. I've expanded out our beer production and added a second brewery, as well as adding some more hops down here. It takes three hop farms to supply two breweries. So it's kind of a weird calculation, uh, but just keep an eye on that statistics screen and you'll be able to keep track of how much you need. I've also built ourselves some window makers. I placed down two window makers, one glass maker, one sand mine, and an extra uh, lumber, uh, lumberjack's hut over here to start making windows, which we are going to need for just about everything else going forward. So let's talk about workforce real quick. The workforce at the top, if you click on it, you'll be brought to a new screen right here called Working Conditions. Working Conditions is a really, really neat little feature where you can increase the overall production of a certain, of any type of production facility by up to 50% and it's scalable. So if we take a look at something, what's, what's something we're like getting a little low on here? Um, let's say schnapps. Uh, let, yeah, let's take a look at schnapps. Not that one. This one right here. Let's take a look at the schnapps production. If I didn't want to build more schnapps distilleries, uh, maybe I'm running low on cash or maybe I'm running low on workforce. What I can do is click on, you do need to do it for the entire chain because you do, if you increase schnapps, you're going to need more potatoes. So if I wanted to increase that by, let's say 10%. Okay, let's increase this by 10%. Now you'll notice that we lost a little bit of happiness. Obviously people don't like working more. So the trade-off from increasing working conditions is lowering the happiness. The amount of happiness you lose is directly affected by how much workforce is impacted. Uh, we have 150 workforce impacted right here. So we're losing 1% happiness. As far as I know, there is no cap. So you can lose a lot of happiness if you do too much of that. Let's go take a look and see what that did for us. That got us a little bit more schnapps right there. Not bad at all. So working conditions is a really clever way to get more production out of your facilities without having to build more facilities. But just be aware that you will increase unhappiness and you will increase the chance of riots at your production facilities if your people um, have too much working conditions, but if you're not a big, if you don't care about that, you can slap that on up to 50% each going to give us minus nine unhappiness. But as you can see right here, that doesn't really hurt us because we still have plus 31. So it's not really the biggest deal right now, unless you just keep doing so much of it. And by doing that, we now have ourselves a nice buffer of three per minute on our schnapps production. So not bad at all. So working conditions, really, really great way of going in and adjusting how much you're producing at the cost of a little bit of happiness, which is why you want to keep those happiness needs fulfilled. So let's take a look at artisan tier stuff now. One of the first things you unlock in the artisan tier is the canned food chain. I'm going to go ahead and say it right now. Don't build this thing just yet. The reason being is a return on investment issue. So we're going to get into a little more advanced stuff here with some return on investment talk. What do I mean by that? If we take a look at a cannery, what does it take to support a cannery? Well, cannery produces every one and a half minutes. 
So I'm going to need one iron mine. I'm going to need two artisanal kitchens because these things produce every two minutes. So I'm going to need two of these to get myself started. Two artisanal kitchens, two cattle farms, and two red pepper farms. That's a grand total of 650 coins to, to support a cannery chain at the moment. That's about half. <laughs> Actually, that's uh, a little more than half of my current balance just to get a cannery up and running. The big problem comes from the, the amount of coins that you get. So you get seven coins for supplying canned food. If we take 650 maintenance and divide that by seven coins, that gives me 93. I need 93 artisan homes to get myself uh, at least breaking even on the cost of the canned food chain. That's a lot of artisan homes early on. You know, that, yes, you can do it. Yes, if you want to go ahead and get 93 to 100 artisan homes, go ahead and do it. But that's kind of the problem. If Right now, I have 20 artisan homes. If I build this, I'm going to be operating at a loss and I'm going to be cutting into my profits. So let's take a look at sewing machines. Sewing machines only needs 700 maintenance. So it's a little bit more expensive than the canned food chain. However, sewing machines give me 14 coins for supplying that. That means I only need 50 homes in order to break even. That's a little easier to swallow than 93 homes to break even. So I can get away with having fewer artisan homes and break even faster on sewing machines than I can the canned food chain. So I think it'd be better to go ahead and get the sewing machines up and running first, get those supplied, get up and unlock the fur coats, and then probably think about doing canned food to get those last little bits you need to get the university unlocked and then move on to the engineer phase where everything basically changes. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to get sewing machines going. We're going to supply those to the people. We're going to skip canned food for right now and we are going to continue on. I'm also going to take care of these expedition events right here so we can keep uh, trekking on and find the new world and get that unlocked so we can prepare for the Obreros and the Arnold, or the Ornoleros rather, and the Obreros in the next episodes. All right, so we have jumped ahead to just a little bit more here. We have unlocked quite a few more things in the artisan tier. Uh, we've gotten up to needing fur coats. We have unlocked the hospital, which you definitely want to save up 40 windows for because as soon as you unlock the hospital, you start uh, running the risk of having illnesses break out. So you want to get at least one hospital down around um, a good section of your city. I'm going to need to build another one over here because I have expanded our population center over to this side of this, this side of the island and added in more people. So I am going to want to get a hospital probably right about in here to try to cover some more of this. We have unlocked the fur coats as well now. Now fur coats do require cotton fabric, which can only be made in the new world. So you will have to get the new world up and running in order to get cotton fabric coming in. Alternatively, you can get lucky and at Eli's Harbor, you can sometimes, sometimes, if you re-roll enough and you get lucky, um, you can find an item called the costume designer. That is a specialist. It is a uh, rare quality. So it's a blue background specialist called costume designer. She replaces the need for cotton fabric with wool. So you can get away with not having to have it brought in from the new world. However, re-rolling is very, very expensive. Uh, it's at 15,000 right now because I did re-roll a few times just to play around with it and test something. It starts at 5,000 and then it increases by 5,000 coins every time you re-roll and it has no cap. So you can sit here and I have gotten it up to like three or four million on the re-roll costs. That's how crazy it is. So be careful. Don't go nuts re-rolling constantly trying to find a specialist. It's probably not worth the money you invest in it. Uh, so we do need fur coats now as well. Uh, we do have just enough artisan homes that once we have fur coats and the canned food taken care of, we will be able to unlock universities as well and move on to the engineer phase of the game. Uh, but to pretty much do anything else at this point, I'm going to have to go to the new world. Well, that's going to be in the next episode. So let's finish off this episode by talking about a few other mechanics to get us going. 
especially moving into the new world because we're about to have to deal with more trade routes. So this is a question that I see pop up all the time. What about different types of trade routes? What about charter routes? Now, charter routes are a unique type of route where you can only transport one type of good on the route from one island to another. You cannot do multiple islands. You cannot go between the AIs, any of the neutral traders or the AIs on the map. It's only between your islands. So for example, say I wanted to move some timber from Flaley down to Catester. I can move up to 80. That's all. I can only move up to 80 tons of goods on a charter route. Let's say I want to move just 10. Okay. It's going to cost me 50 maintenance, but zero influence for now. You can have three charter routes that cost no maintenance. Uh, or no influence, rather, I'm sorry. You can have three charter routes that cost no influence. They always cost 50 maintenance. And then you hit charter, and it's done. What this does is it will summon, there he is right there. It summons a ship from off the map. It summons a little schooner. A simple little schooner that it can only carry one item, or one ton of cargo, right here, one type. Cannot have any other items on it, so no sails or anything. And he's extremely slow. He's actually slightly slower than a standard schooner. And it is not modified by any sort of bonuses that you might have for ship speeds or anything. So what is a good use for a charter route? Well, this is one use for it, what I just did right here. I wanted to transport, keep a little bit of timber going back and forth. I could use a schooner. Obviously, a schooner is cheaper. It's 45 coins cheaper than a charter route. Um, but there's different instances where you might not want to build your own ship, or you may not have the time to build your own ship, or you don't want to wait or anything. There's lots of different reasons. Charter routes have niche uses. Um, you can use them. You can get away with never using charter routes at, completely, and that's perfectly fine. I usually have at least three charter routes, no more than that. Or I would, should say I have at most three charter routes. I never go more than that because once you go past three charter routes, they do cost five influence. So those are very, very expensive for very little uh, product that they transport and for their cost. Um, if you have two islands like this island right here, uh, Herringby, that's right next to Catester, this is a great charter route. Maybe if you wanted to bring over potatoes, let's say. I wanted to bring over potatoes or schnapps from this island to this island. That's a good, ch that's a charter route island. That's a charter route right there. Easy stuff like that if you don't want to build your own ships. Um, but again, if you don't see the point in that, that's perfectly fine. Charter routes, like I said, very, very niche, not a big deal. Um, beyond that, what types of ships should be using on should you be using on your routes? That really just depends on the route. Uh, similar to charter routes, don't use schooners going between regions unless it is just something basic and simple, like maybe construction materials or something you don't really you don't you're not consuming in any large amounts or anything like that. Um, stuff like that. For anything else, always use clippers or better. We'll get into some more detailed stuff about uh, trade routes once we have the new world up and running and we start bringing some goods over. If you have watched some of my other videos about trade route travel times, some of the information will be repetitive, but I do want to cover it in, this, in these videos as well. But again, we're not going to cover that until we get to the new world in the next episode. So the very last thing I want to talk about is DLC content related stuff. As you advance through the artisan tier, you're going to start getting pop-ups for uh, a couple of different quests going on. You're going to get the To the Land of the Lions if you have the Land of Lions uh, DLC. And you'll also get a quest from Archie to come see him about the queen being missing. The Land of Lions quest line is something I recommend going ahead and doing the expedition on. It is just a one skull expedition. It's very easy. Take your flagship once it gets back from finding the new world. Always do the new world first. But the Land of Lions unlocks out of believed it's 250 artisans or 200, somewhere around there, 200, 250, something like that. Go ahead and get there with your flagship after you find the new world. The Land of Lions is really, really, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? It's a cheap region. It's a super cheap region to get up and running. Um, we will do a, an episode covering the Land of Lions and like what you can do to get started there really early and get it up and running and get your islands secured. I do recommend going there pretty quickly. 
All you need to do is get some shepherds going. It's a very, very inexpensive region, and it gives you the opportunity to make a crap ton of money, which we will cover in that episode. The other one that you get is the one for uh, Crown Falls. It's everyone's favorite. You unlock that one at 700 artisans, and it gives you the quest to go, go and get Crown Falls. Now, Crown Falls is something that you can go grab early if you want to. Just be aware of the influence cost. I believe it's 103 influence to claim Crown Falls. So you kind of have to make a choice. Either you go and get Crown Falls immediately and start building there and just say goodbye to the old world, or claim islands in the new world, claim islands in the old world, claim islands in, um, in Bessa, Land of Lions, and start claiming some islands for future expansions that you're going to need. Or go spend a bunch of influence on a single big island and then have to sit there and farm all of that influence back up. So it's kind of a choice. Pick one. Um, I recommend going and getting re islands in other regions first. Go to Crown Falls later. Uh, Crown Falls itself is almost completely self-sufficient. Between that island there and the few islands that you're going to have in the old world, you can basically completely sustain Crown Falls. If you lose every other island in Crown Falls to AI expansion, it's not going to be a big deal. Because uh, Crown Falls, like I said, is basically takes care of itself. Um, I would rather spend the influence on getting other islands in other regions first. So that's kind of different, uh, some different options you want to do. I would go to Crown Falls at least, and uh, you don't have to claim the island immediately. Or it is called technically Cape Trelawney, but you can go there and you don't have to claim the island. The AI cannot settle Cape Trelawney or yeah, now I did it backwards. The AI cannot settle Crown Falls before you do. Uh, they can take it from you if you are at war or they buy it out from you from shares, but they cannot settle it first. So you can at least unlock the region and get access to Nate. Uh, and old Nate has a lot of really good craftable items that you can get. So I would recommend at least going to the region so you have access to the crafting materials there. Uh, but other than that, you, I would not take Crown Falls first thing. I would wait until I had uh, more influence and I had settled some other islands in other regions first to give myself some good footholds. The other thing you will unlock in the artisan phase for DLC content is going to be Docklands. Now, I'm not going to get into Docklands in this series. I do have a full uh, guide breakdown of Docklands, how it works, and what all you can do with it. That is going to be linked down in a pinned comment down below if you need more information about Docklands and how it works. But for the purposes of this guide series, I am not going to be building or doing any Docklands stuff. We're just going to leave that for its own guide that I already spent a lot of time making. And with that, guys, I think that's going to wrap up this episode right here. We've got ourselves a good way into the artisan phase. The next episode is going to be all about the new world and getting ourselves up and running there with our Onoleros and getting everything we need to finish off the artisan uh, phase in the game and move on to engineers. With that, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, be sure to leave a like and a comment down below. Let me know how these videos are helping you or if there's something that I didn't cover or didn't cover well enough that you want to see some more information on. With that, take care. I'll see you in the next one.